Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and honored to be a guest here. I think um, it is important um, to see what is happening in Greece because what is happening in Greece is not at all unique. We are in the midst of a class war. And that's not unusual. Because there's always class war in capitalism. Although sometimes it is hidden, and sometimes there is an interlude of an apparent Carthaginian peace. But the class war has intensified now because of the crisis in capitalism. A crisis rooted in the overaccumulation of capital. And in this crisis, capital has intensified the class war against the working class. Austerity, cutbacks, the need to sacrifice, these are the demands of capital as it calls upon workers to bear the burden of capital's own failures. This is a war conducted by capitalist states against workers to compel them to give up their achievements from past struggles. And in some places, but unfortunately not all, we see that the working class is saying no. In some cases, we see that workers are fighting to defend their past successes within capitalism, and that they are fighting against the racism and xenophobia, which are the default position when workers are under attack, but not in struggle against capital. <coughs> Such struggles, as Marx knew, are indispensable. They are, he said, the only means of preventing workers from becoming, quote, apathetic, thoughtless, more or less well-fed instruments of production, close quote. But who will win this class war? In his recent book, The Communist Hypothesis, Alain Badiou speaks of the past defeats of May 1968, the Chinese Cultural Revolution, the Paris Commune, as well as those of various factory occupations and other struggles, and he describes these as defeats covered with glory. They must be contrasted, Badiou insists, to the defeat without glory that social democracy brings because they remain in our memory as inspirations. And this is certainly true. <coughs> we honor those who have struggled in the past, and we must carry their struggles forward into the future. However, there have been enough glorious defeats. And I suggest to you that the current struggles against capital's attempt to make the working class rescue it from yet another of its crises are likely to be added to the list of glorious defeats. Of course, it's necessary to organize to stop the cutbacks and to demonstrate that capital can be defeated. Of course, it's necessary to communicate to capital how high its costs will be for attempting to shift the burden of its own failures to workers. And of course, we must celebrate the struggle that is taking place wherever the working class has not been anesthetized as a result of previous feats. No. Defeats. <laughs> Sorry, I'm... <laughs> My students always said this. <laughs> Of course, it is necessary to celebrate the struggle that is taking place wherever the working class has not been anesthetized as a result of previous defeats without glory. It is not enough, though, to say no. There are those who think that an accumulation of no's screamed or produced as the silent farts celebrated by John Holloway can be sufficient. However, these poets of negation demonstrate thereby that they don't understand why and how capital reproduces itself. Why is it that after so many defeats, so many still cannot see what Marx grasped in the 19th century? <coughs> he understood that capital has the tendency to produce a working class which views the existence of capital as necessary. The advance of capitalist production, Marx stressed, quote, develops a working class which by education, tradition, and habit looks upon the requirements of this mode of production as self-evident natural laws, close quote. Marx understood that capitalism tends to produce the workers it needs. 
Workers who look upon capitalism as common sense. Given the mystification of capital <coughs> arising from the sale of labor power, which makes productivity, profits, and progress appear <laughs> as a result of the capitalist's contribution, it followed, Marx said, that, quote, the organization of the capitalist process of production, once it is fully developed, breaks down all resistance, close quote. Breaks down all resistance. That's Marx's thing. And Marx proceeded to add that capital's generation of a reserve army of the unemployed, quote, puts the seal on the domination of the capitalist over the worker, close quote. And that the, work, the capitalist can rely upon the worker's, quote, dependence on capital, which springs from the conditions of production themselves and is guaranteed in perpetuity by them, close quote. Guaranteed in perpetuity. Obviously, for Marx, capitalism's walls will never crumble with a loud scream. Of course, there is a certain resistance. A struggle over wages, a struggle over working conditions, a struggle to defend the victories from past battles. However, as long as workers look upon the requirements of capital as self-evident natural laws, those struggles occur within the bounds of the capitalist relation. In the end, their subordination to the logic of capital means that faced with capitalism's crises, they sooner or later act to ensure the conditions for the expanded reproduction of capital. And nowhere is this clearer than in the defeats without glory of social democracy. And defeat, when capitalism is in crisis, means that capital can emerge from the crisis. That it can emerge from the crisis by restructuring itself. <clears throat> as it did internationally with the Bretton Woods package after the crisis of the 1930s. And as it did in the United States beginning in the 1980s with the assault on the working class there. As is often noted, there's a big difference between a crisis in capitalism and a crisis of capitalism. A crisis of capitalism requires conscious actors prepared to put an end to capitalism, prepared to challenge and defeat the logic of capital. But that revolutionary labor process requires a vision it requires a vision which can appear to workers as an alternative common sense, as their common sense. Like the worst architect that Marx spoke about in Capital, we must build the goal in our minds before we can construct it in reality. Only this conscious purpose can ensure the purposeful will required to defeat the logic <laughs> of capital. To struggle against a situation in which workers by education, tradition, and habit look upon capital's needs as self-evident natural laws, we must struggle for an alternative common sense. But what is the vision of a new society whose requirements workers may look upon as self-evident natural laws? Clearly, it is not the results of 20th century attempts to build socialism. Those are attempts which, to use Marx's phrase, at least in the English, ended in a miserable fit of the blues. We have to reinvent socialism. That was the statement with which Hugo Chavez, electrified activists, 
in his closing speech at the 2005 World Social Forum in Porto Alegre, Brazil. And he said, it can't be the kind of socialism <coughs> that we saw in the Soviet Union. But it will emerge as we develop new systems that are built on cooperation, not competition. End of quote. And he continued, if we're ever going to end the poverty of the majority of the world, capitalism must be transcended. Quote, but we cannot resort to state capitalism, which <coughs> would be the same perversion of the Soviet Union. We must reclaim socialism as a thesis, a project, and a path, but a new type of socialism, a humanist one, one which puts humans and not machines or the state ahead of everything." Close quote from Chavez. In short, neither expansion of the means of production nor direction by the state should define the new socialist society. Rather, human beings must be at its center. And that, at its core, is the premise for socialism for the 21st century. And that marks a return to the socialist vision of the 19th century. In particular, it is a return to Marx, to the contrast that he drew in Capital, Volume 1, between a society which is subordinate to the logic of capital, one where the worker, quote, exists to satisfy the needs of existing values for valorization, close quote, and on the other hand, the logic of a new society, which Marx described as, quote, that inverse situation in which objective wealth is there to satisfy the worker's own need for development, end of quote. In other words, Marx talks in capital about the worker's own <coughs> need for development as the core of this alternative society, this inverse society. And here, in this concept of the worker's need for development, is the culmination of Marx's consistent stress upon the centrality of human development his concept of rich human beings, his discussion of the development of the rich individuality, that rich real wealth, which is the development of human capacity. That was the goal, explicit goal of the new society, that inverse situation which would allow for, quote, the all-round development of the individual, the complete working out of the human content, the development of all human powers as such in the end in itself. Those are quotes from the critique of the Gotha program, the Grundriss, etc. With this concept of inverting the capitalist inversion, the society of associated producers would be one in which, in the famous phrase from the Communist Manifesto, the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. But this is only one side of Marx's perspective. A focus upon full development of human potential was characteristic of much socialist thought in the 19th century. What Marx added to this emphasis upon human development was his understanding of how that development of human capacities occurs. In his theses on Feuerbach, he was quite clear that it is not by giving people gifts. It is not by changing circumstances for them. Rather, we change only through real practice. We change only by changing circumstances ourselves. 